for the recordproduction.com interview with Steve Nixon. Hello. We're in Steve, yeah. Steve's okay. lovely room here at, uh, upstairs at Sun West. Um, how have you had this room, Steve? Eight months. So it's all quite new. Quite new. Where were you before? <coughs> I was in Wilsden. I had a huge setup in Wilsden. Very inappropriate for nowadays. Right. <laughs> what so, did you have there then? Uh, I have five rooms, I think. I work with an engineer I've worked with for 25 years. Did you ever meet Heth? Yes. Yeah, Heth. And uh, anyway, it's not the right climate for that behaviour. <laughs> it's a different climate now. Mm. So this room felt more appropriate. Mm. You, you've actually had your own room for quite a long time. You're probably one of the first people to build a producer room, haven't you? Yeah, years ago. But I can't think how long ago. Mm. What's changed then? Why have you come here? Uh, no money. People don't have money. That's what's changed. So having a big setup with high overheads is no longer appropriate. I think mean and lean is is the way to go. Presumably it's not that cheap being in this part of London, though. No, well, that's my problem. Right. So you know what I mean? <laughs> I, I have a room. Yes. And, and uh, I can man it on my own. Right. Or, or I can get one of the guys in to help, or I can go into another room, but I can keep costs down. Yes. Yeah. So you generally work now without an assistant, I presume? Yeah, for, well, if you think about it, what do you, what, I don't know what record making is now. Mm. It's just this sort of- I was of, gonna ask you that. Hello, <laughs> I was gonna ask you. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, really. It's, uh, if I do drums, I go in another room. If I'm doing a band, I go in another room. If yeah. I'm working with a singer, I don't want anyone in the room. You know, it sort of works out quite well. Mm. Do you do vocals in the same room then? You have them staying right here. Breathing down there. Yeah, which is works very well, apart from them um, when they're no good. Right. Because then you know you, you're not in a position to go. What are we going to do? What about the, the design of the room here then? Have you got acoustic treatment going? No it design seems, at all. It seems quite ambient. Doesn't yeah. It? Me too. <laughs> Does that bother you at all? No. no problems? No problems. I think you can get used to anything. Mm. Absolutely anything. Yeah. You haven't thought of sticking lots of foam things to them? Yeah. Are you going to do that? No. No. No, I thought about it. I got bored. <laughs> I don't think. You know what? It doesn't matter. Trevor and I talk about this quite a lot. He, uh, he's had a room done in, in his house, and it's, you know, I think John Flynn has done it. He's very. He loves things, the room sounding good. I do as well, but, but you know, I can't see the point here in doing it. Because mm. uh, I like the room. I like the ambience. Yeah. And I'm quite near to the speakers. The bigs are only for when, you know, something bad's going on. Mm. Works well. Should be good. So you, you're, you're sort of known for being quite a cutting edge of technology. You, didn't you have a Sinclair at one time? Or used the yeah, Sinclair? I used it. That again was Trevor's. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, how have things changed in terms of the being at the, the bleeding edge of technology? Do you think things have improved? And no, I might, I, I might be going against the grain here, but I can't help but think technological advancements seem to make what is around available for more people. That seems mm. to be what the advancements are. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. And is that a good thing or not? I don't know. Is YouTube a good thing? I don't know. You know, is uh, Brideshead Revisited a better thing than spending the evening watching YouTube? Oh, far be it for me to <laughs> make, you know, have an opinion on that. So I don't know. Fair enough. What do you think? I don't know. There we are. Okay. What was your first big break then? How did you start making money then? <clears throat> I had a hit when I was 22 or something with a group called Sniffing the Tears called Driver's Seat, but I didn't know it was a hit. Or I did know it was a hit, but I didn't know what that meant. So that went, sort of went by the wayside. And then I became a freelance engineer and um, didn't earn anything until, I suppose I said, well, then I worked with Trevor for a few mm. years. How did you get involved with Trevor? In he said, would I, uh, I got a call. I didn't, the people who were managing me. Mm. Would, would I uh, engineer for Trevor? And, and I was um, busy doing something at the time. And I thought, you know what? He's, I don't want to work for him. You know, it was that thing where he was very successful and I had the hump in, you know, inside mm. I had the hump about him being successful. I don't want to work with him. Oh, or I'll do three days, you know. 
Then I turned up to do three days and, and ignore, sort of ignored him. Mm. And unwittingly, that was what he wanted. He mm. wanted someone to just get on with the job. Mm. And so we sort of worked well together mm. and that was it. And then we, those three days turned into how many years. Right. So you have a fairly traditional role as, as being the engineer. No, because uh, he, he um, I had started playing guitar on all the records. Right. So the engineering just happened because someone had to be doing it. Yeah. And then uh, we ended up co-producing a load of records. Together. So did he know you were a guitarist when he... He kind of knew. Right. i would mentioned it to him, but he hadn't really clocked it. Mm. So did you walk in with your guitar when you turned that oh, up? Oh, well, I brought it the first day yeah. Yeah. and shoved it in the back of the room. And then I think we were working on... Um, it was probably very cross the Mersey with the Frankie Goes to Hollywood. And and uh, he wasn't there and I just started playing the guitar over it. And according to him, because I don't remember this, he came running in and went, who's, what's that? That's the guitar part. And I said, it's me. He said, you didn't, I said, I did tell you, you know, we didn't listen. And then that was it. And we played, I played on everything. Right. Because in, in those days, it was quite delineated the, uh, the roles of people's jobs in the studios yeah. generally. Kind of. Um, you know, I remember when I was a tape up in the mid 80s, it would be frowned upon if you started having a, a musical opinion as a tape up. Well, that's what happened to me with Jerry Rafferty. Right. <laughs> it was early 80s and we were at Montserrat. And there was a guitar player called Richard Brunton. And uh, I even remember the song. It was a song called Welcome to Hollywood. And uh, I was engineering at the mm. time. And he. They were doing this track and it sounded really weird to me. And it sounded weird because Richard, I thought, was playing in the wrong inversion. He was sort of down here, but had he been up here, it would have spoke better. And so he came up to me because we talked quite a lot. And he said, what did you think? And I said, I think you're playing the wrong inversion. I think it should be higher. And Jerry Rafferty said, what, what's this? What are you talking about? And Richard said, oh, you just said I should try playing an inversion higher. And Jerry Rafferty said to me, uh, he said, you, uh, you just do the engineering. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but that sort of seems to be a rarity in your career then. Most people have quite enjoyed your... Sure, your why not? Life. Yeah. Well, I, I, there's not much of a problem, is there? No. Anyone doing anything. Mm. Well, that's more and more the case, I think, these days. Sure. Well, I think it has been for a while. Yeah. yeah. Writing a song, I remember writing a song with, um, I can't quite remember who it was, but there were a load of us in the room writing a song. And my engineer, Hef, had a few lyrical ideas. There he was, songwriter, mm. not a problem. Um, what do you think the biggest milestones in your career are the most defining projects that you worked on over the years? I don't know. Uh, four, okay. This is Slave to the Rhythm, uh, Propaganda, uh, Annie Lennox Y, uh, S Club 7, funnily enough, mm. or uh, Ronan, like a boy zone. One, there's a song I did with him that I thought was, was uh, indicative of quite a lot. And um, Will Young. Yeah. Right. Because that was, um, yeah, anyway, there you go. And what was special about those, those particular projects? Was it the the level of success or just the enjoyment you had doing them in the studio? Okay, or? so propaganda was um, quite new. Mm. It was new ground. Yeah. Okay, that's that. Uh, Slave to the Rhythm was a lot of work, but I thought the end result, the actual single, was pretty good. Mm. Uh, okay, what was the next? Annie. Why? Yeah. Oh, because because a lot of people seem to like it. So that must go in. S Club 7, because I thought they were really good records, actually. Mm. Loads of them. I thought were excellent pop records of the moment. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Ronan, uh, was it um, When You Say Nothing At All? Or was mm. it that other one? There was two in particular I did with him. And I thought they, they, they captured where he was very mm. well. Mm. So I thought they were good. Uh, and Will, because Will 
had come out of pop idol and was was people thought he was a pop idol and I saw him as something else which we spent quite a lot of time talking about and then made a record right. to reflect what we talked about so I thought that was quite good. I see, so you just hang out with him for a bit and yeah. chat with him. Loads. Right. Yeah. Do you think that's an important part of the yeah. process? Very. So well, actually it depends on the artist. Yeah. I mean, I've just worked with um, the, uh, someone called Jordan Sparks who uh, is this year's, is it this year's American Idol? Winner. I've done <clears throat> some tracks with her and I've spent as long with her as it took for her to sing the songs. So she's brilliant, though, absolutely brilliant. And funnily enough, in that she's she's very eloquent, and I didn't need to spend any more time with her. Right. It, was, it was all very clear. Mm. Tell me a bit more about um, propaganda, because was that pre MIDI? Was that kind of around the turn of MIDI, wasn't it? Uh, it's it was just around challenging sort of. Because uh, if you were to hear it now, not knowing that, you'd assume it was all knocked up in a computer. Well, it was. It was. Uh, was that it was the. Was it a fair light? A Fairlight, it was a Fairlight, it was a PPG Wave yeah. and uh, the Synclavier. Right. And most of it, it was written, the music was written by this guy, Michael Mertens, in the group. Mm -hmm. And he was classically but trained, so his chords are very interesting. Mm. And um, the uh, music, I suppose, was myself and a guy called Andy Richards, mm -hmm. who... Yeah. And we'd sit in the studio, Studio 3 actually, which is just there. And um, we, we'd do mad things with mm. the gear. It was all about the gear, really. Yeah. And so because of that, we pushed it. Actually, there's another record that was quite, um, uh, but for different reasons. Um, Welcome to the Pleasure Dome mm. we, was the first record that I think anyone had, had done. You know that, that idea of um, people don't bother now? but digitally copying and extending. You, you know what I'm talking about. You have a digital multi-track, you copy it onto another digital multi-track, you offset it, mm -hmm. and then copy it back. So suddenly you've got twice as long. Right. You, you know, chop and change all yeah. the stuff with offsets. Mm. I think it was the first time anyone had done that, mm. and it was on that record. Right. Well, that was quite interesting. Yeah, because you just cut and paste it in Pro Tools and you're done in two Absolutely. Minutes. You think records are better than they were 30 years ago? Oh, I don't know. Let's have a look here. <laughs> That's his drumming. No, his drumming is all the way through. I haven't touched it. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> are records better? Yeah. Yeah, of course they're not. But then, then 30 years ago, we, we were listening to Frank Sinatra the other day. Mm. And, and I suspect it's in the 60s. In the 60s, yeah. The records he made in the 60s were probably better and the records we made in the 80s and, mm. and then maybe you could wind the clock back further. Maybe what Mozart did was better than blah, blah, blah. So then why be at the bleeding edge of technological changes then if you can make better things? With because the I find it in interesting. <laughs> I find it really interesting and also uh, that's how it is, mm. isn't it? I mean, just going back to this YouTube thing, I, that's the one that gets me. I think there was a program on Channel 4 early morning that I videoed because it was called, um, I think it's called TV is Dead. And I thought, oh, this sounds quite interesting. I've watched loads of this program. And what they were saying is that the kids under the age of 20 basically don't watch TV anymore. Mm they use their computers. So they're, they're doing whatever it is that they're doing, it's via their computers, be it films mm. that they download or YouTube. But YouTube's fascinating because it's all short yeah. and really bad quality. Mm. And they don't care about either of those mm. things. I don't know what that tells us about society. Well, I think certain music's less important to the kids of today, isn't it? Well, that's a polite way of saying irrelevant. 